Thanks, thanks very much, Jacqueline. It's it's an absolute delight to be here. And now that we've come off summertime, a few weeks ago, uh, eight o'clock in the morning is quite um, is quite doable. Um, I'm actually more more thinking of Bob Garrett sitting there mm. at uh, nine or ten o'clock at Very night, best. having um, been there all day. Uh, but uh, look, this is this is a very, very important series of discussions that you're participating in, and it's great to have heard those two or three comments about the the focus and the value that you've got out of the session so far today. Uh, as we wrap soon, uh, and then move uh, you move into into the next couple of days as well. Um, the world around us is changing. We know that. Uh, our our job in life is to uh, is is to respond well as leaders. And so, what I want to do today is is share off the screen and and just uh, just thirty seconds or so, uh, run you through some thoughts, uh, and then having done that, uh, pass back into Brendan and uh, and Jacqueline uh, and others and have the conversation and hopefully. Uh, as we get towards the end and through to the end of the session, there will have been some value uh, that people can take away. So without, without any further ado, uh, let me now share the screen and if somebody can confirm that uh, they can now see governing amidst turmoil. We've got that. Thanks, Carla. Yes, we can. Uh, yes. Excellent. Now, this is, this is a good start. I always... Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, we've been using Zoom and Teams for two years, and uh, and and oh, there's just always that hesitation. So thank you for letting me uh, uh, just confirm uh, that that's the case. Uh, so today, uh, this is this is our topic. Our role as governors and leaders is still to govern. We know that we're sitting in this turmoil. That's self-evident. Uh, so. Uh, in, in relation to today, uh, that is me. You can look at me in the website. There's always there's already been that reference to, to LinkedIn. Uh, but over the next 20 or 30 minutes, uh, I, I, we'll open what for many will seem like a Pandora's box. Uh, we'll explore several pressing issues, uh, acknowledge and focus in on boards and the need to govern well, despite everything that's swirling around. And, uh, and then offer some thoughts as to how we might go about this. Now, needless to say, in 20 or 30 minutes, we're going to go nowhere towards being exhaustive on these issues or categorical on these issues. Uh, it's going to be a general commentary. But my hope is that by illuminating some of the issues, uh, the comments will serve as a catalyst for healthy debate, not only within this cohort on this uh, call, uh, but also back in your own boardrooms, back in your own leadership teams. And as you read and as you wrestle uh, with some of the issues that are raised uh, and, and what goes beyond. So let's get started. This picture is apt. I was raised in a rural farming community, not a great big cropping uh, um, farm like this, but a dairy farm. Uh, but the picture remains apt because it tells us everything we need to know. Storm clouds are upon us. We could hide, we could wait, and we could ignore them. But farming needs to continue. So such responses of hiding and waiting and ignoring uh, would be to our peril. Uh, we need to press on. We need to plant the crop. We need to harvest the crop. We need to operate our business, having considered the circumstances that are in front of us, those that might be around the corner, and having adjusted based on what lies ahead. And to say that there's lots to consider would be an understatement, wouldn't it? It's swirling around us. And what's more, the landscape, every day we wake up, it's a little bit different. That landscape is far from static. There's external factors all over the place. They abound, they're dynamic, and our board of directors has little, if any, control over any of them. And what is more, there's very few absolutes. 
the boundary between business and civil society has become quite blurred. Uh, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, activists all over, stakeholder capitalism, and add to that untold numbers of consultants peddling their wares, uh, it's little wonder boards have started to struggle. The reputation surveys for boards of directors in business uh, have us as, as leaders down low, not quite with real estate agents and car salesmen, uh, but in many quarters, uh, that reputation is low. And, that, and that's a problem. So if companies are to survive amidst this turmoil and sustain performance over the longer term, uh, boards need to focus on the issues head on. And they need to work out how to respond well. And many of the themes you see here on the slide have been discussed ad nauseum. So I won't add too much, save to say that things that seem irrelevant at first may not be. Boards need to be alert. Now you notice there that I've used perhaps some slightly different language uh, than some you use on these matters. I've not mentioned ESG, just sustainability. I'll come back to that. Energy security is a clear and present issue, uh, not only uh, for renewables, but with the geopolitics uh, in, in Eastern Europe at present. Uh, how, does, how does Europe stay warm? How does Europe maintain that energy source? These are very, very real big issues. Um, I use participation more than DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, because it's less loaded. And you help those other things in there. But I do want to mention this one, because it is hot. Um, to the extent it's become an esoteric buzzword, it's a little bit like uh, uh, governance was 10 and 15 years ago, where everybody was talking about the thing, everybody was using the word expectations were such that uh, if we've got ESG, we can solve all manner of social and environmental problems. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the response is easy, it's ESG. We'll put some ESG things in place, uh, we'll measure, we'll report, uh, but like, and 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 for many, uh, the ESG narrative has now grown to such an extent that, like global warming, like diversity, like COVID nineteen, the pandemic, uh, many individuals have framed strong opinions on what it is, what it could be, what we need to do, what's good, what's bad, and we've taken sides, even to the point of moving from the tension of trying to wrestle with it. Uh, to the conflict of being firm in our views, and that's unhelpful. ESG itself is conceptually really, really simple, but its implementation is complex. Questions such as, what is it? And why should a board care uh, remain unanswered in many cases? So let's, let's jump into that um, and, and, and without fear, without favour, uh, and, and argue the toss and simply recognise that ESG is a catch-all term, first coined in 2005 in the UN uh, with the purpose of extending corporate reporting beyond financial metrics and to apply pressure to companies to look beyond the financial numbers. It's great. So it's a reporting mechanism. But awkwardly, the term itself has never been well defined. The three letters stand for three things, environmental, social, and governance. And also the underlying drivers for how it should be implemented or how it should even be embraced are quite different depending on where you are. In the EU, for example, uh, largely um, the nations are social democracies. Uh, there's a tendency towards big state, even socialist leaning in some cases, uh, and there's high levels of interest in social and environmental matters, uh, and, and regulation features highly. In the US and UK, in contrast, the liberal democracies with slightly less government intervention, although some would argue that's changing, uh, ESG uh, is good business. 
and and uh, the big institutions, the Black Rocks, the Vanguards, the State Streets of this world uh, are pushing the agenda. But to what effect? Well, investors, especially institutional investors, are applying pressure, their stated belief that ESG-based funds provide more sustainable long-term value creation. And if that's the case, that's good. But all is not quite what it seems. Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, founder, chairman, um, perhaps a scion of not good board practice, uh, just as an aside, uh, is increasingly being criticised uh, that he's putting his own interests and his own opinions ahead of the, those of the investors uh, who, who put money in his funds or, or of the companies to which BlackRock is invested. So there's question marks there. Uh, but, and, and you can see there that only one quarter of boards actually understand what SG is. And so these facts here start to beg some interesting questions like are expectations about ESG reasonable or we just got a feeding frenzy? Are the investments well placed? I'm not convinced. And if we take Unilever, a reasonably well-known, high-profile high retail brand, uh, for, for um, they got caught up in political correctness under Paul Polman. He was the CEO for a decade to 2019. Uh, interestingly, uh, when we look at the numbers, the company struggled to compete uh, during the time of his leadership. It did a lot of good things, but it struggled to compete in the stock price language. Uh, and since his departure, some of the work that he instituted has actually been wound back out. Back to Larry Fink, he wrote his first letter to shareholders and, and to, um, sorry, to, to the CEOs of the companies they invested in that letter in 2012, the motivation of which is becoming clearer, uh, the interests of the author. Warren Buffett's letter I read each year as well, I find it far more illuminating because it talks about sustainable business investing um, for those interests of the Berkshire Hathaway investors. But perhaps most awkwardly, uh, the point at the bottom, little if any of the ESG effort to date has made any difference at all. And when I sit back and talk to boards and directors here in New Zealand and Australia and around the world, almost universally, uh, when they speak candidly, they, they talk about uh, making a huge impact, making a difference, leaving a legacy, being sustainable so that when they finish their role as a director, the company will continue to perform at high levels. Uh, but when I look inside boardrooms, there's a gap. Observing boards in action, uh, the picture is consistent and clear. It's a little bit like footprints on the tide line. We're walking along the Caribbean beach, but for the passing of a couple of hours, you'd hardly know the board had met, much less made any difference. So well, though well-intentioned, many board contributions are about as enduring as those footprints. So if that's the board, what hope has the company got when it comes to operating in a sustainable manner amongst this turmoil that's happening around the world? Now you might say, that's a bit of a melancholic view, but it's not just my opinion. Here's a survey that was published about four, four or five weeks ago, survey of around 14, nearly 1,500 CEOs and, uh, and directors and C-suite executives uh, from across industries, across geographies, uh, produce some interesting insights. I'll just lift out four. First, eight out of 10 respondents claim to be above average in relation to environmental sustainability. Eight out of 10. Which is kind of interesting because average is the middle, and I wonder where the other eight out of 10 fit into the remaining 20%. So we've got this inflated view, the Dunning Kruger effect, uh, that we think we're doing quite well is alive and well. But interestingly, only one third, 36% of those company leaders say that they've got measurement tools in place to track their sustainability efforts. So, how well? How do they know how well they're doing if they're not measuring? 
And what's more, fewer than half of those with measurement tools, 17% of the total, uh, use the data to optimize their sustainability efforts. And here's the kicker. Over two thirds of survey respondents admit guilt in relation to greenwashing. So many companies are playing with expectations or playing to expectations, should I say, and gaming the system. And quite where boards are in this mix raises some uncomfortable questions in that regard as well. So many boards have responded by embracing a defensive posture. Here's my good friends, uh, and they've taken their hands off the wheel. Uh, their response is consistent with the three questions that I get asked most often. What is the role of the board? They've become confused. Uh, what is governance? How should it be practiced? Uh, so ignoring that problem or hiding from it will not solve it. And so with that, uh, we can see that the landscape is messy. There's expectations all over the place. And despite what boards claim, many boards struggle to know how to press on. So let's turn our attention uh, to that very question. What might the role of the board be in the future? What role could or should it take? Where are the gaps and how might they be filled? The starting point, clearly, is to clarify the board's job. Uh, and, in, and in law, in regulation, the starting point is, is, is to ensure the ongoing and through that implied is long-term uh, performance of the company. And for that, it needs to look ahead, it needs to look around, it needs to consider what's going on, it needs to make decisions, smart decisions. It needs to manage what can be managed, mitigate the rest. Some minor things can be ignored. But importantly, despite the pressures from the outside, the board should not, decide, should not cede decision rights in terms of uh, operating a company because it holds that mandate and therefore it must continue. And therein lies our first clue. Directors need to ensure they're up to speed with the relevant issues. There are many. Uh, emerging trends, there are many. Disruptions, stakeholder expectations, they're changing. But as few as one in six directors are, the rest are not. And this means grappling with the macro issues, understanding what terms like ESG and sustainability are and mean, where participation lies, uh, discerning and distinguishing uh, between what is ideological and what is substantive, and if and how any might be relevant to the company's future. And, and many will be, but some won't be. So alongside really important that directors and boards have a healthy dose of scepticism, because not everything that one reads or hears is necessarily correct. So with that a word of caution, as leaders, we might think we understand the moving parts, we can see them perhaps, we, we know the possible moves uh, because we played before and we plan accordingly. But the reality is somewhat messy and, and the goal needs to be clear. And so when MLK stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, the goal was clear, civil rights. And for companies, it's less clear. So our starting point needs to be sorted out. Why does your company exist? Do you know? Does everyone around the board table know? And importantly, have they all got the same answer? In my experience, few as one in 20 have the same answer. And the reason it gets messy is self-evident because after the 28th of August, 1963, the dream was set, but the implementation uh, has been contended and continues to be contended to this day. But having said that, some principles do hold. If the company is to have any hope 
of achieving its performance and sustainability goals of navigating through the turmoil of charting this course for things are needed. It needs to know why it exists. Purpose. Strategy to advance some underlying values that underpin both behavior standards and decision making. And if we turn our attention to the board, the board's role in achieving corporate goals has a name, governance. And it's that term that was not widely used 20 or 30 years ago. Boards either directed or they oversaw management, or less charitably, they turned up and rubber stamped management decisions, sometimes worse. But in the last decade or so, the terms become ubiquitous and um, it's now second only to words like ESG. A panacea, even for all manner of organizational ills. In this picture, wonderful analogy. There's lots going on. A subset of what we control, of a subset of which we can control. Now, performing that role, that is to direct and control, the board needs to balance these two things. Uh, and, and this is the enduring, this is the enduring challenge for boards, isn't it? The default is to the left to protect what standards need to be ahead to. Are we compliant? Did we do what planned? Are we using the right reporting mechanisms, TCFD, GRI, whatever's emerging? How do we keep safe? And therein lies our second clue. The protection of personal and professional reputation is a powerful driver of boardroom behavior. We've got forces pressing in from all angles. And if we're focusing in on responding what's on the outside, that leaves little protection, little time, little energy for what the board is actually there for. Now this might sound basic, but it's what I see repeatedly. The strategic governance framework offers a pathway for boards to navigate through that to chart this course to govern perhaps more effectively. It's not a guaranteed best practice, nothing like it. It's a mechanism to enable boards to wrestle with and prioritize in pursuit of longer term objectives and more sustainable outcomes. And it's relevant uh, because it focuses the board on the things that matter. If the board is to have any hope of having an impact on the long-term purpose of the company, so the company represented in that big light, circle, uh, light square, uh, um, there's some things that matter. And the first is the board needs to understand what impact it wants to make. And it needs to have a really, really good understanding of the external issues that press in, whether the shareholder issues, regulatory frameworks, what's happening environmentally and, so and socially. Without that understanding, the hope of having any impact is close to zero. But more than that, the board itself uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be doing some things. And the first is, is that um, uh, the, the impact in terms of the board's contribution is a function of just three things. What those directors bring, their capability, what they do, activity, and there's a very good framework called the learning board framework uh, that many of you may have seen. Uh, and, and that would probably be the best that I've seen over 25 or 30 years in this area. Uh, and, and the behaviors, um, so how directors act and interact. I'm not going into the detail of those today, uh, but together they frame the strategic governance framework, which enable boards to focus on collecting the information discerning, making decisions, given what's going on, given what the strategy is, the goal of which is to have an enduring impact beyond the company. If any of those three things in the circles are missing, the likelihood of the board having imp any impact at all is not. So they're multiplicative. Turning now to leadership. Underlying leadership qualities are several. And you'll see here that, um, that, that these are qualities, they're not structures. And that also all directors need to be engaged. 
uh, they need to have a sense of purpose and be strategically competent. But more than that, that's at the individual level. At the collective level, the board of directors uh, need to work together. So the board needs to debate the issues. Directors need to be prepared, uh, but, but having debated the issues, the board needs to make decisions. And then subsequent to that, provide instructions to the chief executive to implement and then exert control and guidance in a constructive manner. Anything else? Now, it is probably window dressing. Now, you may come back and look at these nine and realize there might be some others, and you're probably right. But these are the clear and present significant qualities that, um, that are needed from a leadership perspective, both across the board and the leadership team. The next most important building block of the board's going to have any hope of being effective amongst the turmoil uh, concerns engagement, finding out what's going on. Everybody on this call is a leader. You do this stuff every day. And the boards that you're party to, the boards that you report to, the boards that you know about, if they're doing their job properly, are no different questions. If we wait for it to come to us, we're going to be too late. And turning back to that appropriate board focus, the intention action outcome linkage will be familiar to many. Often it's missing in action, but it'll be familiar to any many. Uh, it's necessary. If we're going to have any hope of taking strategy through to outcome, we need to get these lined up. So alignment is crucial, uh, but it's not sufficient. If boards are to have any hope of governing well amidst the turmoil discussed today, uh, to ensure the company operates sustainably and that the objectives and the desired outcomes are achieved, uh, it needs to ensure alignment, not only through the first three, but alignment with the first. What do we aspire to? Now, if we unpack this a little bit, there are three questions that boards should be asking. The first question they ask all the time, are we doing what we said we would? Mr. Chief Executive, Ms. Chief Executive, uh, we said we'd do this last month. We said we'd do this last quarter. How are we getting on? How's strategy? Are our projects on time, on budget? Are we within the legal framework? Uh, boards do this. Boards do this reasonably well. So that's good. But there's two more questions. And the second is this, are we doing the right things? Boards do not ask this question very often. And the reason they don't ask it is because often the purpose of a company is less well-defined or they simply don't think about it. Uh, the purpose of a company needs to be in the context of those prevailing external circumstances not drawn on the diagram for simplicity but as a board are we doing um, are we convinced that strategically we're doing the right things to achieve the purpose the cause that we've set out for and that that question needs to be asked on an ongoing basis and the third question also not asked that often um, when we signed off this strategy, when we signed off this project, did we establish the desired outcomes? Not just the results, but the outcomes. And if we did, do we keep going back subsequent to the decision, subsequent to the implementation of the decision to make sure that those desired outcomes were actually realized? And do we test that against why the company exists, its purpose? So all three of those questions are crucial in boardrooms, not just the first one. And together, this is governance in action. So if the board has got something such as the strategic governance framework and it is asking these three questions, then the likelihood of it being better placed to respond in the turmoil is high. It's not a guarantee. So let's not shy away from that real world. 
change is about the only constant we can rely on at the moment, I'd suggest. Uh, and keeping up his heart. You know, I read for something like 90 minutes every day, uh, seven days a week, uh, on news feeds, on, on various documents that come across the, the email and websites, etc. Uh, and, that, and that's to try and keep up with what's going on. And I'm reasonably ruthless with what I read, uh, but we need to read broadly. Uh, philosophy, sector knowledge, technical expertise. Uh, we, we need to know what's going on. Competitive forces. So board work is tough. And strategy in particular can be quite messy. The temptation is that we build it and we leave it alone for three years, five years. We can't do that. We've got to build it. But we need to keep our head up. We need to keep our eyes open. We need to watch for light, watch for what lies ahead. We need to look to the side. And as an academic in, in the US, um, Rita Gunter uh, um, says, uh, we need to be able to look around corners. We need to be able to see around corners. Those weak signals um, that might portend something dangerous coming, those disruptions, those new trends and more. And sort of summarizing now with a few more questions uh, that boards may consider, recognizing that things do change and boards don't operate in isolation, but ultimately time is money and, and those results do matter. Uh, here, here are four questions. And I'm not going to read them out, but I'll just click them up and, and you, can, you can read them yourself and you can ponder them uh, as we do. So the first in relation, uh, to watching outwards. And do we know? And how are we spending our time? And how are we allocating our resources? These are the big questions. They're not an exclusive set of questions, but these are big questions that boards can and should be thinking about amidst the turmoil. And you'll notice that as we've gone through this, we've highlighted some of the macro issues that are happening globally. I haven't dug into Putin because I don't have the answers. I haven't gone into the heat wave in India because I haven't the answers. Uh, I haven't gone into the energy security in the, EU, in the EU because I haven't the answers. And the reality is that almost no boards have the answers. So what we need to do, and hopefully we've been able to at least expose the nature of the question today, is do we understand what is going on? Do we understand what hits our supply chain? Do we understand what might be an influence positive or negatively on our business in the Caribbean and beyond. And are we in a position to respond well? Because that, ladies and gentlemen, is our job. And if we don't do that, who will? Thank you very much. And with that, and you can see there, there's some contact details, but I hope that those thoughts uh, have been uh, useful. And with that, I'm going to uh, stop the share and hand back to the moderator uh, so that we can have a conversation. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you very much, Peter. I mean, that was really, I think, slightly alarming. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> what, what did resonate with me was when you said, if we wait, it will be too late. And I must say for myself, when I think about um, ESG and, and the Caribbean or yeah, the Caribbean islands, I think we have, we have been slow on the uptake. Some of the larger companies are there already, but a lot of companies are still figuring out if it really does concern them. And mm -hmm. I've always had the view that well, we have time for, the, for Europe and the States to figure it out, and then we can jump on board. But from what you're saying, we have to get on board right now. We don't have that luxury of, of waiting 
um, to see yeah. what happens. We need to start. Well, I, now. I, I think, yeah, and I think you're right. But but um, my council, because the Caribbean's a little bit like New Zealand, where we're we're a um, <clears throat> we're a small island nation. Um, it uses a, you know the Caribbean as a as a group of nations. Uh, our contribution to the global economy is not much. Uh, in New Zealand, we're we're mm. a pastoral economy. Seventy one percent of our of our export receipts come off the land. So we're amongst the world's most efficient food producers. Uh, um, and in something like three quarters of our energy is from renewables, mainly hydro, but also geothermal and, um, and, and, and increasingly, but a small amount of wind. So we're positioned differently. Mm. Uh, the, question, the question for countries like uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, others across the Caribbean, as with New Zealand, is are we aware of what's going on? And should we stand mm -hmm. on the leading edge? Should we stand ahead and bleed because that's yes. very expensive? Yeah. Or should we be a fast follower? Mm. What we do know is if we don't respond, then somebody else will do it to us, and that could be quite painful. Yes, yes. Thank okay. you for that. All right. Well, I think now we then we'll hand over to Brenda. Maybe you can give us some insights on your thoughts from your perspective and your experience in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Well, great <laughs> pre presentation, Peter. Lots of very yes. good questions raised, um, which I think are very helpful as we navigate a lot of issues, especially for us on the boards. Um, you know, sometimes it can be complacent and we listen to the CEO or the executive present and we don't challenge and, and uh, you know, we're, we're perhaps not fulfilling as much of the role as we can. So that's something to keep definitely in mind. Um, and I think you've raised a lot of issues for boards to look out. You know, I'm especially interested in globalization and what we're seeing um, happening around the world and the impact that has in the Caribbean. You're hearing a lot of things around Globalization is over, uh, nearshoring is going to take place, and global supply chains have been impacted. Um, you look at the Caribbean, you know, significant amount of food and energy importation at this point, obviously relying on tourism in many markets, but manufacturing growing, agriculture growing a bit. Um, you know, as you are also from a small island state, how do you see the the these big forces in place now, how do you see them impacting our, our countries in, in the region? We've got to be smart. Uh, so so one, one of the things that I heard uh, said probably a decade ago now, and I thought, that sounds really, really interesting. Uh, and, and it sounded superficial, but it, um, it's resonated and it's remained with me. And that was a, a chap called Phil O'Reilly, who was the head of our business New Zealand, which is our apex business influencer. Uh, he said at the time that New Zealand was in a not unique, but a very privileged position of being um, friends with many and having no enemies. Uh, and, and because we just signed a, a free trade agreement with China and, and, of course, we had all these other agreements and we're part of ANZUS, Australia, New Zealand, US. Uh, but increasingly, we, we, we're being forced to take sides. And, uh, and that's a polarising and, quite frankly, scary thought. So, number one, uh, we need to go to the basics and look after our people by way of food supply, uh, living conditions in the bottom part of the Maslow hierarchy almost and that might sound a little simplistic but you know we, we need to look after that and we've got a, we've got a um a moral and ethical um responsibility around that the second is uh, related to that i think that um companies need to sorry not companies countries need to be prepared to um, encourage people to be less reliant on, on international uh, importation of goods. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the in the Caribbean, you you may not be as well placed as New Zealand in terms of energy security. So maybe mm -hmm. there's some investment there that starts to make sense. Uh, I I worry about tourism for both of our um, areas uh, because tourism, um, the dominant forces in tourism are the airlines and the hotel chains and very mm. few of them are headquartered in the Caribbean or in mm -hmm. New Zealand and so that means the profits go offshore 
And many of the workers in those in that sector are low paid workers. And so how much value on a sustainable basis are you providing or are you just moving money around so that the big guys win more? Um, so I don't have a black and white answer to the question, but we, um, we ignore it at our peril. Uh, and, but I do think that we need to work hard to um, become less reliant on, um, on, on overseas um, mm. countries than perhaps, you know, Singapore's done a good job. Finland's doing a good job. Uh, and, and there'll be other countries that are aware of it as well. So we need to look at who's doing what, but not automatically copy them because we're in different circumstances. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah, one of, one of the issues that was bothering me or concerning me about the statement you just made is that really is looking maybe for... Um, you need, you need the guidance then, a philosophy coming out of your government. Then you need a, 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 a philosophy that will encourage the country to move, move in that way. Um, as a board of directors, I would say, well, that might be above my pay grade kind of thing as a director. This is really a country issue. We need a, a country strategy. We need a, a way in which we can all move forward, hear the beat of the same drum, that we're going to, we used to have it, eat local. We're not going to eat you know, for, we're going to reduce imports, you know, things like that. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I, I'm going to declare a political card and, and I don't want this to descend into some sort of geo, geopolitical debate, but I've got a natural bias um, away from big state. I, I think if we talk about the, the big blocks of people and activity within a nation state um, we have government and their job is to provide infrastructure set rules so that's fine Uh, we have the the business or economic sector uh, and we have civil society i think it's important for each of those to stay in their lanes uh, but but to interact with the other two well Uh, the danger um, um, is that we jump over to the other lane because we don't think it's doing very well. And, and uh, we had that in New Zealand a little bit with our government extending reach. Now, in and of itself, that's not necessarily bad or good, uh, but what it does is, is when somebody else comes to do your job for you, um, it's, it's easy to sit back and, and, and um, just take it easy. And that's probably a bad, um, it's probably a bad incentive response. Uh, or people might fight it. Um, I I think that the industry associations have got a big role to play. Um, It may be folly. I'd be very interested to see what Brendan and and Bob had to say on this, uh, given their global experience well. It may be folly for a country to to have a countrywide strategy, if you will. Um, Trump had Buy America. He, he, um, He decided that making America great again was a good thing. Now, through the, through the pure uh, force of personality, he made some progress on that, and well done. Um, Putin's doing it with weapons, uh, and, and the EU's doing it with regulation. Um, all, all have their, I, I hesitate to say merits, but, but all have their, have their positives and negatives. Uh, and, yeah, it's tough. If I can jump in, I think you make a really good point around a couple of really good points around staying in your lane. And we see Canada went through some challenges, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s where the government felt it could do the job of the private sector and energy and a bunch of other areas and uh, spent beyond its its uh, its ability. Um, you know, I had some serious discussions with the IMF and, um, you know, thankfully, through some tough decisions. Um, have, have moved in the right direction and, and got the situation under control. Hopefully that'll stay the same. You know, we see the same situation in Jamaica, you know, through a lot of very tough sacrifices by the people and, and consistency by the government. You've seen them uh, focus very much more so on, you know, as you said, making a conducive business environment to let business thrive and do what it does very well. And we've seen the positive impacts we see in Jamaica. Um, and the other area you bring up is, is um, you know, industry associations. You know, I'm a former banker and, um, yeah. 
you know, when the when the banking association comes together with a with a proposal to government, you know, that has real weight behind it because it's got you know the heft of, of the, the the financial sector. But it works the same in energy or in manufacturing and in, in agriculture. If you can get the voices aligned and speak there in a consistent way, I think you can gain that kind of partnership, and you can see progress being made. Um, you know, the government will see the merits of it. Uh, hope, hopefully, and you'll see progress being made. So I think those are, are good lessons. And, and how it circles back to companies, of course, is you know encouraging your company that you're a member of to be looking outward, you know, not be inwardly focused all the time. But we see that you know on boards I've been on and companies I've been in, you know, that can be a problem when you start to look inwardly uh, and think you have all the answers. But if you can look outwardly, see what's happening around the world, see what's happening with your competition, and then work together with your industry to make the infrastructure changes, perhaps, you know, financial infrastructure, actual physical infrastructure, those changes that can be made to help that economy grow, help the people prosper. So, you know, I, I think the company has a real role, the industry has a role to work together with government to solve some of the key issues. Look, I think that's right. And, uh, you know, in Canada, I'm quite familiar with the big farming setups in Alberta mm. and Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a dairy farming community. And at certain times of the year, the families got together, neighboring families. So each of us ran our yeah. own, quote, business. Uh, but it was when it was haymaking time, somebody had the baler, somebody had the haymar, um, us, us as kids had the manual labour, um, it wasn't discretion, we were involved, we had to be, uh, yep. um, and we, we, look, we, we looked to the Amish people in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and sometimes we mock, but we look at, now, now that's not socialism, mm. it's, it's a community working together, um, yep. with with um, and the common goal is that we're going to help each other. We're not the common goal is not socialism. It's going to be we, we're going to we've got the spirit of helping each other because together we can get that tide climbing a little bit. Um, we still might compete, but we're a little bit sure. mature about it. And mm -hmm. and I think this this um, that's just a you know if 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 that sort of local level. Uh, can scale up to regional and national, um, then then that gives us half a chance. Uh, note, uh, we've got ideology sitting in the mix here, so different groups see it quite differently. I see that uh, Fahim has a question in, in the chat, so I just want to address it quickly as we come back to um, this topic. And Fahim was asking whether we, we looked at the whole issue of um, competence of directors, because a lot of the discussion is presupposing that, you know, um, and um, in terms of what really are the objectives of the individual directors when they're appointed. So I, I just wanted to share with Fahim, we often raise those questions when we are dealing with appointment of state-owned enterprises. In the private sector, we tend to take it as given that persons are appointed on the basis of some measure competence. What we do find on, and these were raised by Peter very clearly in this presentation, and that is, is the board working together? Or are we fragmented in our approach in terms of who is saying what do we really want and, and how are we using the resources of the organization? How are we charting that, that path? And I think that is a very important conversation for us to have uh, as we look at, at, you know, even individual organizations, because then the individual make the some parts of the, the country and then how the country itself moves forward. So it, it's really the level of leadership that we need to see because um, at an international level, uh, we can see a very fragmented world. If I can touch on and, that, and, Ken, and, yeah. yeah, please do. So, yeah, I think you raise a really good point around director competency. And, you know, what I've been um, pleased to be involved in is um, what would be like uh, director self-assessments or board self-assessment um, exercises that take place, but not just as a, you know, a ticking the box thing. You know, when I was chairman of the board in Trinidad uh, for the for Scotia Bank and in the DR, um, you know, it was my role as chairman and the head of the the nomination committee, we would have one-on-one -on -one interviews with directors saying, you know, and trying to do this in a very transparent way, 
what's working well, what isn't, what are the weaknesses of the board. And that goes to, you know, individual d directors, you know, and we would have sometimes, I remember on one, one board, there was the consensus that certain directors weren't pulling their weight. You know, they were, weren't talking during the meetings. They weren't adding anything. So, you know, we can't have that. So that as my role then as chairman would be to meet with those directors and say, you know, we need more out of you. Are you prepared or not? And then move forward to ensure the board is really doing all the things that Peters and many of us have, have talk, talked about. So, um, you know, I think that can be a very important exercise if it's done right with rigor and, uh, um, you know, tra transparency and the ability and, and the willingness of directors to really say what they, what they feel. Mm. Yes, did you have anything to add to that, Peter? Uh, no, I, was, um, I think I think the guts of it has been said that there is yes. um, self-assessment will take you to some extent, but it needs to be a rigorous external process. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've got a natural we've got a natural instinct as directors to think mm. that we are pretty good. Yes. Um, we yeah. we um, you know and and um, some some of us might be individually. But but um, how do we stack up collectively, and uh, and can we get all, our ducks lined up to achieve something? And you know, Bob Bob um, Garrett spends a considerable amount of his time working explicitly in this area to help boards understand where they're really at. Mm -hmm. But you had mentioned when you were speaking that one of the issues you said we have to um, ask the question, or the board should ask the question: Are we doing the right thing? And I think that's a, a tremendously sort of powerful statement when they stop you, mm. stop what you're doing and think, well, is what, we're, is what we're doing the correct thing? Correct for the community, correct for the company, correct for the state stakeholders, for each of the, um, mm. the different um, sort of participants in the enterprise. And I think, I mean, it's a very, it could be a very loaded and very deep issue. I mean, if you put the layer of sort of COVID and how companies navigated COVID, and treated with their staff as they were moving through it. Um, mm. It was a sort of mm. real live living example, but there'll be other examples that maybe not as, as striking as that. And, uh, and, uh, and I, th I think you make a good point and tucked in behind that is, uh, and making sure some of those assumptions that sit around the question are also, uh, let's just say resolved, such as who are our stakeholders? Mm. What mm -hmm. is our role in the community? Uh, you can choose anything you like. You can choose to ignore certain groups. Now, it might be to your peril if they've got a strong influential view. Uh, but as a board, we've got a duty of care to be lined up around a view on a particular point. And there's several points that we need to spend time with. And the good boards do this. Uh, and they go away and they have these, they have these quite deep conversations and, and unusually it all resolves in one hour over a meal. You know, it's, it's an <laughs> ongoing conversation. Yes. Sometimes it works over a gin or a rum because you're in the Caribbean, I know, but. Uh... <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's, it sure helps. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and is that, is that, um... Well, that is, I suppose, the E and the S of the ESG, um, which I, which it from, from sort of my perspective of the Caribbean is still a very new thing that is developing. Mm -hmm. What do you, should, should we maybe put the brakes on a bit and wait until there is a standard? I mean, there's a lot of um, sort of disruption going on as to the, the various standards that exist and which is a better one and what is happening. Um, oh. What are your views on that? Look, if you wait, it'll get done to you, and it might you might not like what gets done to you. <laughs> uh, there's there's a um, last time I looked, there are about nine different standards in tow in various places around the world, and I mentioned TCFD and the you know the IIRC and the mm. has just consolidated with another, and and you've got a first reporting in terms of international financial reporting standards, and they're extending into some other places. Uh, I think the thing we need to understand with reporting and disclosures is they 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 are thresholds, they are boundaries. Uh, and, and our job as, as boards and as executives within companies is to report in accordance with 
and uh, there seems to be a coalescing of, of reporting standard uh, in the EU, another one in the US. Um, UK sort of seems to be similar to the, to the US, although I'm not familiar enough, close enough with it. Others may have a view. Um, the Asia-Pacific is, is less well um, organised and less mature in this regard, although advancing mm -hmm. reasonably rapidly. Um, but but the, the point that I guess I'm making is that reporting is one thing. Uh, most companies will report on the basis of compliance and therefore they'll tick the box mm -hmm. and move on. Uh, some of them, uh, and I commented on Tesla's latest impact report, it's long on, com it's long. It's got mm. a lot, but it's got nothing to say. It's, mm. it's, it's um, you know, it's short on substance. Um, and, and it feels like the marketing department or the investor relations department has had a field day. And it may be. Uh, and it may be that Elon Musk is just not interested. You know, I, I, I don't, you know, let's not worry about the motivation. But the response is that um, great big reporting regimes do not drive company performance. They, they mm -hmm. inform others. Uh, my view is, is that if boards were active, if boards were considered and if boards were transparent within the realms of confidentiality, within the bounds of confidentiality, uh, they'd produce reports that were insightful. And maybe maybe the regulatory framework would not be needed to the same extent. Mm -hmm. mm. But, uh, but it's not the black and white answer. Hmm. May I yeah. um, just take the, the, the conversation mm -hmm. in a slightly different direction? Because mm -hmm. uh, the whole ESG conversation did begin more than a year ago, and it, it was building a, a lot of force. But sometimes now, um, Peter, I'm not sure if we are forcing the conversation to keep it on the forefront, because the reality is the, the world has changed significantly since Russia invaded Ukraine. <laughs> now, all, all the talk about at COP26 with the, the zero carbon emissions and all those things, it's, it's, that's just gone. If we look at the reality of, so what are we faced with today? And, and I was glad that you raised that whole issue even of agriculture and, and sustainability because we are seeing when the supply chain is disrupted, now mm -hmm. it's survival that organizations mm -hmm. need to look yeah. at. So everything yeah, you do correct. with yeah. history is just lovely to say and, and might end up to be one of those plaques on your wall, but it's not reflected in the reality of what you do. So keeping that yeah. in mind... Um, Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I've got a reasonably strong view on this, and that is that mm -hmm. COP sixty, the COP twenty six, is probably generating uh, more hot air than solutions, uh, mm -hmm. and that's and that's going to be that's going to perhaps offend one or more people on the call. And if it does, I'm sorry. Uh, the 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 fact that it was immediately displaced by something else gives us a clue that 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 many big businesses uh, are not engaged gives us a clue. Um, we, we can and should respond uh, to the big issues of the day and the big issue of the day are, are, are reasonably foundational and fundamental, aren't they? Food supply, supply chain, human safety, uh, you, you know, those sort of things. They're the big issues. Uh, and, and yes, um, you know, there's a report in New Zealand that came out just in the last sort of three or four weeks about the rising sea levels. Mm. Um, but what it, what it does not do is say, well, the tectonic, you know, New Zealand's on the border between two tectonic plates. And um, on, on one side, the, the, the seashore is going down because the plate is going down. So is the sea rising or is the plate going down? You know, that's <laughs> uh, not discussed. So, yeah. so you know, there's a, lot, there's, a, there's a lot in this and we need to be careful and, and discerning as directors, not just to grab something because it's a shiny advertisement in a magazine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So this is this is this is big stuff. This is well, tough, but we need to get the yeah. with the basics. Hey, eh, Brendan. Sorry, Brendan. No, mm -hmm. it's very well put, and it's something you know we struggle with here in Canada a lot. You know, uh, you know, Canada, very very large country, small pop population, relatively speaking. Yeah. You know, one to two percent of global emissions. 
Um, so whatever we do here in Canada is not going to have a meaningful impact around the world. Yet we won't build pipelines. We want to keep our oil in the ground. We actually import oil in, into Canada from Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and leave ours in the ground. So you get thinking that starts to, you know, divert from even not only net national interest, it's obviously in the national interest of Canada to use its own resources, but in the global interest of, you know, it's the cleanest energies or the cleanest that, that you can get and, and environmentally, a lot of protections and, and, and laws around it. So, you know, it's challenging to look at things like this because you especially look at India and China who aren't at the level where they're gonna be concerned about this. You know, China is doing a lot of things in, in, in building energy because they need the energy, not because mm. they want to yeah. be green, Correct. right? Mm. You know, so, yeah. and Correct. India is not, is the same or, or, or not even as much. So, um, you know, for, for small island states with, you know, at sea, at sea level, et cetera, these are very concerning things, but um, companies and, and organizations within the country, you know, can continue to push hard and should push hard in my view for action to be taken, but also have to be aware that whatever can be done lo lo locally is what they can control. So, mm. you know, I'll, I'll put it open for others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think one has to, well, you have to look at it in the, in the, in the context, as you're uh, both saying of the environment in which you're living. Now, I think for the small Caribbean islands, climate change has affected us. And you do mm -hmm. see it, and you do see it with the seaweed on the beaches mm -hmm. and the things yep. you can't control. Right. And for, uh, yep. uh, for economies that are dependent on tourism, I mean, that's mm -hmm. horribly, um, a horrible disaster. Um, yeah. But at the, and at the same time, you have to look at it in the context of Trinidad and Tobago. And we have mm -hmm. so much cheap Guyana, energy here. Surinam, yeah. We have know. so much cheap energy there, as you do just leave it and right. concentrate on solar energy and wind farms? Or do you have to find some mix of the two that is suited for your environment and move ahead with that? So mm -hmm. I suppose that's a lot of food for thought for a board of directors <laughs> to sit down and debate <laughs> around their, lun their luncheon or at the board table. Mm -hmm. I, I see uh, Gareth uh, has a oh, sorry. We ask him to, to join the conversation. Professor Gareth, did you have something that you wanted to add as well? Because I saw that you had... Oh, I, I was just going to say that in the last few weeks, I've had three conversations with boards. Um, uh, a very simple one-line question. Is defence part of S? Mm. Sustainability, <laughs> right? Defence. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's created, uh, say the least, uh, a lot of confusion amongst a lot of right on investors. <laughs> um, I have a question I'd like to ask you um, in, in the context of what you shared, because um, you described New Zealand, you know, having some similar features to the, the Caribbean in terms of small islands and so. But I was interested to know how is it that New Zealand has invested so far ahead in renewable energies. Is it because those were the natural resources that were available to you? Or was there some other philosophy that drove that? So what then, and it ties into what Jacqueline was saying a short while ago, you know, do you use what resources you have or um, wh what should guide the, the board in their choice? So what led to New Zealand having such a focus on uh, renewable energies? as its source of energy? Oh, look, our grandfathers um, is the answer. The, the, um, what was prudent at the time, so New Zealand is, you know, it's, it's, it's so say it's mountainous is, is probably overstating it, but, you know, it's a, it's a country where the rivers are characterised as being short and, and of a high elevation difference. And so the water rushes down, and so it's easy to, to dam them up and to put some equipment and turbines and hydro uh, and generate electricity. So it's, it's, it's easy, it's cheap, you know, once you've spent the capital to, to build the concrete dam, uh, and you can get on with it. And, and so um, this started happening in the 19 teens and 20s at scale, so 100 years ago. And Waikato River, which is our longest river, 
Uh, it's got nine hydro dams on it. Um, we built a hydro dam in, um, in uh, the South Island, uh, which generates 18, 18.18% of our national uh, energy generation, uh, simply in response to a, a Rio Tinto uh, aluminium smelter, which uses a considerable amount, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I think that we can put rose-colored glasses on this um, mm -hmm. and simply say uh, that no, let's take those glasses back off again. Uh, there was there was a whole a whole heap of really really pragmatic um, discussion and debate, which said we got rivers, let's dam them up, let's make electricity. Um, um, because that's better, faster, cheaper than digging coal out of the ground. Mm. We've got good coal, but it's better, faster, cheaper than digging coal out of the ground. Next. That was the same in and Canada without, too. Without being yeah. too dismissive, yep. do you know what I mean? Mm. Yep, yep. Same in Canada too, lots of rivers. So, you know, in Ontario and Quebec especially. And now we're exporting yeah. that energy down to the U.S. through, you know, big, long hydro lines that go down. Mm. And so that's been a tremendous benefit to us. But again, you know, how much of that was, you know, prescient thinking versus here's a big river, mm -hmm. you know, yes. and it started with cutting wood and stuff, you know, when we started the country out, you know, we were cutting wood and you put a dam up because you needed the energy to, you know, cut the wood, et cetera. So, and that grew and grew and grew and Niagara Falls, of course, is world famous, uh, generate a lot of electricity there. So it was things that are there around you. You know, and, and yeah. those things make a lot of sense, you know, and, you know, can we look at that? The Caribbean was solar, you know, mm -hmm. where the sun yeah. is around us and we have that. And now we're starting to see the solar finally come, you know, the pricing of panels is coming down and reliability and energy efficiency is improving. So hopefully that can be something that we can continue to, to see happen, you know, and take what's, what's around us. Mm -hmm. So the, there is the, a, a um, fairly long, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, go ahead, Peter, please. No, no, no. I was just going to comment that we need to be careful on, on whether it's the historical situation with hydro in New Zealand or solar in various countries. We need to be careful that we think uh, completely uh, in terms of um, total lifetime cost. Uh, so, you know, there's a massive capital cost to start a hydro yeah. system. Uh, including the social cost of everybody who's living below the waterline when the dam fills up upstream, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Massive. Uh, but there's an equally massive and typically hidden cost um, with electric vehicles uh, to do with the mining of the of the um, ores that come out of um, the Congo and China and lithium and all this cobalt and all of this. Mm. Uh, and how and how does all that get moderated out and costed through? So there's some big challenging economic calculations and the whole scheme of things right. here. Mm -hmm. The reality check is this. We're heading towards 9 billion people. Uh, and in my lifetime, the population's increased by between two and a half and three times globally. So naturally, uh, even if we are generating one unit of, of, of energy as humans per unit of time per day, uh, there's three times as much now as there was in 1962 sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, some, there's, some, there's some big, quick, you know, mine's bigger than mine by a long way uh, need to be applied to this. Um, and um, yeah, it's tough. Mm -hmm. But boards need to have their eyes open and their heads up, and, and they need to be talking about these things more so than, than did we make budget last month. Right. Mm. So it's not just the financials. <laughs> we have to sit down and discuss these yeah. issues. Well, if we're yeah. not, we're, we're walking backwards, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, Jack. Can I ask you to ask uh, Peter for some closing comments and Brandon as well? Because I want yeah, to sure. give uh, Professor Garrett and, and Peter Alwyn some time to wrap up for today's um, start of this Great World Transfer. And, of course. Um, I saw Christy just put on the chat, so I want to remind everyone, I'm so grateful. Almost all of you have been with us all day. So the, there's a survey. We invite you to give your feedback. Please make sure you do that before you leave. So Jackie, yes, go ahead, mm -hmm. please. Yes. All right. Sure. Well, 
Peter, shall you, you give us some closing comments that you'd like to make? Well, look, I, I, think, I think people have heard well enough of my voice and, <laughs> and, uh, and what I had to say. Um, if they, if they um, you know, if people do want to know more, there's a website, there's a LinkedIn profile, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm happy to continue the conversation, but let's, let's have other voices um, more so than mine as we wrap up. Mm. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Opportunity. Oh, it's been tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Well, I'll move on to Brendan. Maybe you could say something that will provoke Peter. Well, just a quick thing, you know, and I, I think the conversation has been really good around, mm -hmm. you know, the role of boards in terms of holding management accountable, looking at the financials, etc. But, you know, ensuring that we don't take our eye off the big picture, the big mm -hmm. forces that are changing our world, changing the environment in which our companies work in, and how are we going to adapt? How are we going to ensure that we're prepared for the next challenge that's coming our, our, our way. You know, as someone said to him, to look around the corner is so yes. important and so difficult to do. So, you know, encourage everybody to, you know, while we're looking at our day to day and ensuring we're holding, you know, people accountable for projects and results that the board is looking at the big picture and, and mm -hmm. carving out time for those kind of conversations that can really lead to transformative th thinking and ensuring the con you know the companies and the countries that we all are in and, and love so so dearly are prepared for what comes next it's not mm -hmm. going to be easy as we talked about we're all set up on esg and all set up on environment then all of a sudden the war breaks out and mm -hmm. as P peter said you go back to your maslow order of 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 key things that are important yeah. and it's food supply it's security safety you know those things get pushed to, to the yeah. top very quick quick quickly so need to be able to to adapt and stay flexible. Thank you. That's extremely, extremely so. Um, Professor Garrett, are you going to help us out here with some closing comments? OK, a uh, couple of things. I've been struck uh, particularly um, as we're at the start of a three part session. I'm not going to try and uh, focus just on mm. this session but I've been struck by the global mindsets that have been coming through. I think people are beginning to think much more widely than uh, they have before. And the one that really struck me um, most is people are beginning to think more ecologically. They're yes. thinking of the business as part of um, an ecological system in which the business only exists if the energy niches on all sides of it actually support it. And as soon as those niches don't support it, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's an interesting thing I'd take through. The, um, in regards to the Caribbean, yes, the, I mean, people have been talking about the fact that the business really is about tourism and or financial services and with a little bit of oil and gas. Um, and that's about it. Um, but when we think about the natural side of things, we've already just mentioned now solar. Uh, and to an extent, water. Um, one thing that always strikes me about the Caribbean is it can be bloody windy. Um, mm -hmm. And the whole wind energy side, if I stand out uh, from Bathsheba, um, looking All north, right. yes. yeah. um, on the east coast of Barbados, I can be blown off my feet. Um, there's a huge natural resource um, up there, but it's not just in Barbados. It's it's around mm -hmm. the islands, which, and it doesn't it doesn't take a huge amount of uh, uh, sunk cost to actually produce a wind turbine. And if I go back to an island, my family knows well the Isle of Wight or off the south coast of England. Um, you know they they've actually really gone in for making turbine blades now, and that's become yeah. a major industry. Some of these blades mm -hmm. are now nearly 600 feet high each blade and they're on wind farms all around the world now and that's very mm. interesting the way that sort of things and the other thing that struck me about water in the Caribbean was uh, I assume but don't know there must be some quite big tidal flows and that's another source mm. of energy which doesn't have to have a lot of rivers mm -hmm. and hydroelectric stuff in that so those sort of just in my mind but the, the thing that really struck me is that the, um, the real source of natural um, uh, resource for the Caribbean, particularly, is people. 
And yes. you've got some extremely bright and extremely mm -hmm. uh, uh, hospitable folk. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking that, you know, just down the road from here, there is a really grotty bit of London called Shoreditch, mm -hmm. um, which has become so fashionable in the last 10 years that it's ridiculous. It's still grotty. The buildings are fairly awful, um, but they're now extremely expensive. And the reason yeah. for that is because a certain next generation type person with a stubbly beard and a, a rather <laughs> awful pair of shoes uh, moved in and um, <laughs> they were interested in gaming, not gambling, but gaming, yes, computer gaming. games. Uh -huh. They are now the world center of computer gaming. Their mm -hmm. output from this rather small and grotty bit of London is already over two billion a year. And that's just people with ideas and pursuing a hobby, yes. really. Uh, but it, it's very interesting what is possible. That's mm -hmm. all I'll say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's a great, um, great thought that human capital is something we really need to not lose in the in the analysis yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, I've said, save the best for last. Oh, thank you kindly. Well, look, um, <laughs> I don't know about that, but look, yeah, we de definitely discussed the depth of human capital in the uh, entrepreneurship discussion uh, mm -hmm. previously. Yes. But certainly uh, very much enjoyed uh, Dr. Crow's uh, pr presentation. There are a few key points. Uh, I mean, there are many key points that I could come away with. Uh, but look, uh, particularly on the, the definition and the meaning of ESG, um, I, I'm, I'm in totally agreement with, with your view that unless we are part of being the catalyst on what the definition of such means, don't be um, disappointed if you're more a follower at the other end and not happy mm. with the structure and the governance and the framework of it. The advantage that you have in the bird's eye view, which, which was an initial catalyst for, for this conference, the next generation, hence the name. So yes. the next gens that do have the financial wherewithal, um, either through their charity, charity, charitable involvements, the methods in which they invest uh, with a, uh, an essence of a philosophy focused on impact and ESG, um, they're the champions that give initial seed funding obviously to these investments, they put one mm -hmm. to five to 10 million into things that would otherwise have no life. And often the financial aspect is, is less of a motivation, it's more the passion and they hope to make a profit. But in order for this to flourish, and, and I've, I, 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 this won't be any, any news to Bob, um, I think what can put the, the um, Caribbean ahead of the game is to think in terms of what would the institutions want and how do we create a new alternative investment category, a serious one, because the governance of such does not yet exist. The framework of such does not yet exist. And Bob liked uh, E uh, plus ESG and I like E plus E plus ESG, which is entrepreneurship plus economic returns plus mm -hmm. ESG, because you cannot expect a, a serious institutional investment manager or pension fund manager or a sovereign wealth fund, et cetera, to allocate um, the serious portion of their portfolio that has to perform. It's one thing to say, okay, we'll allocate 1% to impact. And that is money that they want just in a stable thing. And they'll put it into something like, um, it could be um, sustainable retirement villages or whatever, but they're parking money to just check a box. We don't mm. want that. We want to cultivate the environment around that. So if the, and, and many surveys have said, if the economic returns plus the risk profile were uh, aligned or identical to a regular for-profit, but non-impact investment, then people will choose the impact investment. So uh, leading the charge on that with the next gens can help seed and catalyze some of these early stage ideas you have. But where you've got the advantage is, is being able to frame the governance on the definition of what E plus E plus ESG means. And I put this out because, uh, again, give the comparison of alternative investment categories, um, such as hedge funds, such as venture capital, um, such as, 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 as many, many other uh, categories that, ex that, that, that exist, uh, private equity being another one. Um, where were they 25 to 30 years ago? Many of them were in their infancy or mm -hmm. a much, much lower proportion of investment was dedicated to that. Um, and I look at social impact and ESG. Okay, there, there are minor differences, but essentially we're talking about the same intention 
and positive energy behind it where you're measuring the social impact and yeah. the metrics which are not yet defined i think it can be it can move very very quickly and in five to 15 years um i know there's going to be a lot of rebadging so you're taking it from one basket and just putting in another and it's, it's the same thing but i i think it'd be in, it's going to be a very interesting world when there's five trillion in debt and bonds and five trillion in equity uh, equities and capital um in the social legitimized social impact investments and i think the first movers that move that move there you've, you've got again we had david a guest speaker who worked for the dalio family who are arguably the the biggest family in hedge funds um and and one of my I, I, i've got many many friends in the hedge fund area i think we're going to be looking at the the new stephen schwartzman's of private equity the new uh peter teals like a vc and we're going to be looking at of course the 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 dalios and the soroses of course are of the next era are likely going to be linked to this esg and impact and so creating the environment thinking with the governmental and institutional investor lens is key because we the next gen are already invested, but if you can help them with the proper policy and the proper structure, gain that, that flow of institutional money, you're actually doing those next gens a favor. And the mistake is, and, and David, and, and, and I think maybe Kevin even touched upon, everyone's chasing the, the wealthy class and the family offices and the billionaires with, with an ask. And you don't need to do that because you've already got your, your independent sovereign nations that can unify and you actually have unified on these issues, you are actually stronger than any one or even groups of many billionaires. So how do you how do you form your own dam and create the energy of your own economic returns plus ESG um, uh, plus entrepreneurship plus ESG and 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 be the, be what is your Davos? It'd be my question. And I, I'm I'm likely to go there again in a, in a couple of weeks. What is your Davos around this area and what is the area that you wish to be champions of? I think you just need to partner with those champions that are already have put their money where their mouth is, even when it wasn't about the money, it was about making a difference. And you've seen, of course, with Kevin as an example, he does a number of things that uh, to, 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 to do good and make a profit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. That's, thank you for that, Peter. I mean, you've given us the vision. We just need to get our hands dirty and start to implement it putting the proper frameworks in place and getting on with the job. Each one of us here in the Caribbean. On this conference too, that can also lend their hands. So it's, it's not just vision, but the, some yes. of the key people that are speaking here are there to, to you know, reach out to them, to help. ask them for help. Uh, Absolutely. They're here because they love to give. But I must say that the positive side of all of this, I think it's a tremendously exciting time. Nothing stays the same. There's change. And hopefully we'll get our hands dirty and make it a change for the better. I'm going Absolutely. to hand this all, all back now to Kamala, indomitable Kamala. Kamala, thank you so much.